had a, a motel uh, out here on the east side of town. Uh, well, it was uh, it, originally it was known as the Boggs Motel. It was built by a guy named Ray Boggs. Um, he built the uh, kind of restaurant and he called it a gift shop building. He had a restaurant and also a little coffee shop. I guess they were two separate separate rooms in there. Um, and then he had these little cabins that he kind of built around in that sort of half circle uh, out there that he rented. Uh, it later was called the Wishing Well Restaurant. Um, and that's what I always heard it called as was the Wishing Well. And um, I'm not sure when it closed, maybe late 60s, early 70s. Does anyone remember? They had a fire sometime in the late 50s, uh, which I think kind of gutted the, the uh, inside of the restaurant building. And so they, they did rebuild it, but I don't think it was ever really quite the same. But, but uh, if, you, if you research newspapers and you put in like Boggs or uh, uh, Wishing Well Restaurant from Smithboro, uh, he, they advertised in a bunch of newspapers in the area to get people to come in. Uh, this was a postcard photo. Uh, it's not a real great photo, but that shows you the, the bottom is the dining room and then the top part is the little coffee shop that they had. Uh, my dad, Worked there as a bus boy when he was in high school. Um, he said he remembered that Mr. Boggs didn't didn't particularly pay very well, and that he didn't like to hire a lot of people. So, he, my dad said he remembered when he worked there, they only had one waitress. Oh. Yeah, and he said so very often he had to fill in as he as a as kind of a waiter or bring food and stuff out. And then uh, this is uh, the aerial picture of it here from 1968. So they still, if they still had uh, a lot of the buildings that were around there. What was the restaurant building is now a house. I'm not sure who lives there. Is the person that lives there here? No, by chance, no. Uh, anyway, they they really fixed that that house. They fixed up that building really nice and turned it into a private home. So yeah, and all the uh, all the cabins are gone. I remember some of the cabins being there, but I remember it was all kind of grown up around them. They were they weren't they weren't being used anymore. So, okay, uh, one of the last things I kind of wanted to do was uh, talk a little bit about the times that Smithboro has been in the national news. Yeah, and there's been a few times. Yeah, um, probably one of the first ones was uh, there were uh, some stories about what was called the Smithboro Riot. And uh, apparently there was, uh, there was a saloon here in town and I guess a lot of the workers at the coal mine were in there, and apparently they were, they were starting to have too much. And so um, they, um, the, the bartender shut them off. Well, that caused a riot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and according to the articles that I read, the only way that they were able to settle down in the riot was when the bartender agreed to serve them outside, outside the bar instead of inside. And so that, that, that sort of got them to calm down. Um, the, the next big one was, uh, this, this is the front page of the uh, Globe Democrat. It said, uh, uh, Bandit compliments deputies' uh, marksmanship. Um, and this was a robbery that took place at the uh, Smithboro Depot. And it's kind of a, a strange story, but this appeared in newspapers all over the country, um, kind of because it was such a strange story. I just showed you the one from the, the Globe Democrat, mainly because they actually went to the trouble of having an artist kind of draw the draw a, a scene of what the gun battle looked like, and I'm sure it's embellished quite a bit. But uh, what had happened was they had this guy that had come from Ohio, and he ended up in Sorrento. And he kind of befriended a guy that ran a skating rink in Sorrento. So I'm not sure where the skating rink in Sorrento was. I, I assume it was outdoors somewhere. But anyway, he kind of befriended this guy, and he convinced him that they were going to come down to Smithboro because he had heard that the depot at Smithboro handled lots of money, he probably assumed because of the mine and all that, that that there would be lots of money here. And he sort of uh, convinced him to help him uh, rob the uh, depot. So um, what they did was the two men boarded the uh, uh, Burlington train in Sorrento. And unbeknownst to them, they were being followed by the sheriff's deputy that was uh, located up in Sorrento. His last name was Brown. And uh, Deputy Brown... Uh, he actually got on board the engine and expected the men to get off at Smithboro. Well, actually, I guess they kind of tricked him a little bit. And what they did was they didn't get off until they got to Hookdale just in case someone was following them. And so then they walked back to Smithboro from Hookdale. Well, Officer Brown uh, 
was waiting for them, uh, but he wasn't making it obvious. He was trying to make his, uh, you know, parents uh, little known, and they couldn't. He he, at, but they did manage to actually rob the depot. All they got was eighteen dollars, which you know was worth more than what it is now. You know, back in this was in nineteen oh seven. Uh, you know, certainly worth more then, but you know, it wasn't a huge sum of money. Um, so, uh, but anyway. The uh, deputy then, after they had, had robbed the depot um, right, uh, right along the railroad tracks, he uh, confronted one of the men. He actually managed to arrest them. And while he was trying to handcuff uh, one of the men, the other man started shooting at him. And he fired something like seven shots. And I think only one of them hit him. And it wasn't, wasn't very serious. So the uh, uh, so deputy here in, in Smithboro. Well, it turns out the man who was the, the second robber, the one that was being arrested, actually was an informant. <laughs> he was the one that actually told Deputy Brown about this plan. And so that is how Deputy Brown knew to you know, get on the train and knew that they were going to rob, rob the, uh, the depot here in Smithboro. So the, the guy was kind of worried about you know, that there might be other gang members around and, and things like that. So they were trying to you know, cover up the fact that he was, uh, he was an informant, so what they did was from Smithboro, they put him on the train and sent him to East St. Louis. Well, this story became sort of a national you know, news in all, all these newspapers, and so the police down in East St. Louis, when they saw this guy, they thought, well, he matches the description of this, this guy, and so they arrested him down there thinking, oh, hey, we found the, we found the second robber. And it wasn't until later on when the, uh, the uh, deputies, the sheriff in uh, uh, Greenville let them know that, no, this guy... We got him out of town for his own safety. He was actually helping us, so they they released him from from, from the jail in East St. Louis. So, so yeah, kind of an interesting story. Um, this story involves uh, this bank building that's that's right here. Uh, yeah, Smithville had a bank for for a few years, but unfortunately, in 1914, it was involved in a a big banking scandal, which actually almost I mean, it really came close to bringing down the banking system in the United States. Um, it was owned by this Lorimer Monday. Uh, 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 they were, they were um, actually two men with the last name Lorimer and Monday from Chicago area that owned uh, some banks. The uh, LaSalle Street Bank was one that they owned, uh, and they owned some other banks uh, throughout the Midwest, and including the Smithboro Bank. They had bought the Smithboro Bank. They also owned a bank in Litchfield, uh, I think they own the one in Marine. But basically what they were doing was using all these banks basically to float all these notes in order to make them, you know, seem like they had a lot more money than they really did. And so the Smithboro Bank was, uh, was kind of the, one of the first ones that, uh, that fell to that. And um, ended up, uh, a number of banks in Chicago ended up going bust because a lot of them had loaned money to these other banks thinking that they were worth much more. And um, so a lot of them went under. So <laughs> by the time it was all said and done, the Smithboro Bank, I think they said they had about $30,000 $30, in deposits, which were lost. Uh, all the depositors here in town lost their money. But that kind of paled in comparison by the time the, the, the thing was over and done with because a number of banks in Chicago had, had gone bust and, and millions of dollars were lost. So... Then uh, here's another one that uh, a lot of you will probably remember. Yeah, the train derailment. This happened in December of 1981. Um, it was along the, uh, the it was the uh, Conrail at that time, uh, the old Pennsylvania tracks. Um, it caused the evacuation of the town. Um, there were some uh, tank cars that uh, you can kind of see right here. There's a couple of tank cars that they were concerned about them leaking, and so they evacuated the whole town. So. Uh, how many of you all remember that? Yeah. Where did you all go? I, rem I remember my grandma and her sister. Her sister were down visiting for the holidays, and they came over to our house. So where, where did you go? Yeah. 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 Did you have to, did you have to leave too? No. No. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so er yeah, everybody had to leave town, I think, for what was it, a couple of days? Uh, something like that. They, they evacuated the town. Uh, fortunately, there, I, 
I, I don't think they were actually leaking, or if they were, it wasn't very much. But, uh, but yeah, that actually made national headlines. Uh, it was, it was in a lot of, a lot of newspapers on national news. Here's another picture of it. Uh, the other thing too was um, there was a couple of cars full of uh, brand new automobiles. Uh, yeah, and as I recall, they were Ford Fairmounts. Uh, so if any of any of you were unlucky enough to have a Ford Fairmount, you probably think that being turned upside down on a train car could only make them better. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I do remember Midwest Commodities uh, was brought over to help clean up. Um, and my understanding is all the cars were uh, all the automobiles were scrapped. Uh, none of them were sold for for new cars. They all had to be scrapped. And then there was another train derailment. I think what was it, 2016? Yeah, it's not not been too many years ago. This isn't a real great picture. It's this one I got online. But again, it was on all the oops, it was on all the uh, St. Louis stations. Come on, stay with me. There you go. It was on all the St. Louis stations, and it also made made some national news then too. So. Uh, fortunately, I don't think anyone was hurt from that, and there wasn't any any hazardous materials involved. So, so, um, so that that's kind of the history of Smithboro. Um, I thought I would tell you, just as I said, since my dad's not here, I'll I'll tell you a, a few stories that I remember him telling when he was a kid. Um, as I said, they they came to here, they came to Smithboro in 1941. They moved from Collinsville. Uh, my dad said that uh, they packed everything that they owned on the back of a Model A pickup truck, or Model A flatbed truck, and my dad said that he and his brother rode on the back of that truck all the way from Collinsville, just out in the open air, and sure enough, my uncle fell off over by, uh, as they were coming over the Shoal Creek Bridge. And, uh, yeah, he, he said, uh, my uncle kept walking up to the edge, and he said, I kept warning him, he said, don't, you know, don't do that, come back here, and he said, sure enough, uh, as they were going over the Shoal Creek bridges, he hit a little bump, and he goes, there goes my uncle. And so my dad said he starts banging on the cab of the truck and saying, Dad, Dad, Brub fell off. And so uh, they went back and picked him up, brushed him off, and he was fine, I, I guess. Or if, if you know my Uncle Bub, maybe, maybe that explains some things. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so yeah, so they got into town. Uh, and as I said, it was, it was 1941. Uh, I think Dad said it was like September of 1941 when they moved here. Um, and so, uh, as he said, my grandpa already knew everybody in town. So it, it took them a little bit to get to know know some people. My dad said he remembered one Sunday morning um, when they kind of looked out the window and they saw that everybody was congregating in front of the grocery store. And they couldn't figure out why. Why, you know, the grocery store was normally closed on Sunday. They couldn't figure out why, why all these cars were pulling up in front of the store. So my grandpa said, well, I'll go over and see what's happening. So my dad said he remembers standing in the door watching my grandpa go over to the grocery store. And he said a couple of minutes later, he said, my grandpa's running back across the street yelling, turn the radio on, turn the radio on, the Japs are bombing us. And that was Pearl Harbor. Yeah, and so what had happened was uh, the, everyone thought, you know, there's kind of a panic, everyone, you know, one of the, you know, go buy food and all that stuff. So they managed to, they convinced the, the grocery store to open up for them. So uh, that day, um, being a railroad town, my dad uh, also recalls that there were hobos and it wasn't unusual for them to get a knock at the door and there being maybe one or two men that were standing there. He said they were always very polite and they always asked, you know, if they had anything to eat. And he said, my grandma would always give something. Um, said, you know, maybe if it was something that was left over from what they uh, they had that night, or maybe it would just be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or maybe it was, you know, some, some cookies or pie or something like that. But she always gave something to them. Dad said that was kind of a kind of a common occurrence. So, oh yeah, Try, trying to get him into in, in time, huh? Yeah, yeah. The the other story I meant to tell about my dad too was. Uh, he said on Saturdays, on Saturday mornings, they used to, believe it or not, catch a train to Greenville. They would take the train to Greenville, and they would get off, and then they'd go see a, a matinee movie. And then there wasn't a train going back the other direction at that time. So Dad said it never failed. He said we were never stranded in Greenville. There was always somebody from Greenville that was going to Smithboro that we knew that we could hit up for a ride. And he said uh, more often than not, uh, Judge Biggs, uh, I guess Judge Biggs had a Cadillac limousine, 
an old Cadillac that he that he drove around in. And so Dad said several times they they got to ride in this Cadillac, and he thought that was that was you know, the greatest thing to ride ride back to Smithboro in that old Cadillac. So. <laughs>